morning, Joe Ritchie and Todd Omen. Um, Joe, as you know, you are the plaintiff and Todd, you are the lead attorney in a key case that's advancing early use of the New York Green Amendment. The case you're involved in is the case of the people of the state of New York versus Norlight. But community members like Lights Out Norlight and others have intervened in this legal action. So before we jump into some of the legalese, Joe, can you just tell us a little bit about, about your community? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for uh, speaking with us today. This is a very critical issue. Uh, I'm from Cohoes, New York, which is settled along the Hudson River in northern Albany County in New York State. Um, it's a small town. We call ourselves a city, but it's more or less a town. We have about 17,000 people who live in our city. And for 21 years of my life, um, up until a couple of years ago, I lived next to the Saratoga Sites Public Housing Development, which was just a stone's throw away from the Norlight Hazardous Waste Incinerator. Um, but besides that, I love my community. We're home to the Cohoes Falls and up on the hill here where it's the second largest waterfall in New York State. Some amazing food in our city, such as Hot Dog Charlie's, which is also located right across the street from Norlight. Um, and just some amazing memories growing up in my town, playing with soccer, going to doing field and track and doing all the sorts of clubs within the school. Uh, I think the people who run our schools and the people who are in our communities are amazing. And we're just trying to right the wrongs of the past to get this Norlight facility shut down. So can you also then tell us a little bit about Norlight? What is Norlight and what has been happening at this operation that's raising concerns for you? Sure. So um, Norlight was originally put in the city of Cohoes around the 1950s. And uh, they were meant to, at that time, you know, just deal with, I believe, coal and the simple, the simple industry that used to be around back then. But it was not, not until around the 19. 60s in which Saratoga Sites was placed there um, right next to the Norlight facility and there's a great book that, um, that describes how the land used to look like uh, before Norlight was I'm sorry before Saratoga Sites was there and they pretty much called it um, a dust bowl a wasteland it was not desirable land for property but you know through the war on poverty they were very ambitious to put up as many housing developments as possible to provide low income housing for those who can't afford high rents. So they put Saratoga sites there. And for decades, Norlight has been since impacting the residents who live there and uh, been violating rule after rule, law after law for decades. That's noted on the New York State DEC website um, from at least the 1990s. But Norlight, what they do today is they incinerate hazardous waste and they sell a product that is called lightweight aggregate. And that goes into materials such as cinder blocks and other materials that are meant for building to make things lighter, hence the name. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes this lightweight aggregate can be made up of 80% and 100% of sludge, essentially a lot of heavy metals and wastes that they've been able to use a, an exemption for for quite some time up until very recently. Um, so, you know, Norlight is a bad neighbor. I know when I was living there at Saratoga sites, during the winter times, we would see things like black snow. Sometimes going out to play during the summertime, we would see clouds of, of dust and, and really bad stuff coming right at us from the fence line. And we were kids and we had no idea what, what that was. Um, and I remember just cleaning the house uh, during the summer and even the winter time and, and seeing my paper towels and napkins, even though I just cleaned this windowsill maybe a couple of days ago, it's now covered in black, uh, not ash, but dust, we, we later found out. So it was very scary looking back at it now living at Saratoga sites, unfortunately. It was a great community to live in. Everyone knew each other, but we've had to since re remove the residents there. We worked with the housing authority and relocate everybody to safer housing. 
So we're happy that happened. Um, and now we're working with the city of Cohoes to make sure that that land is used properly and not going to be used again for housing or hopefully anything. <laughs> so we're doing a lot uh, behind the scenes at Lights Out Norlight, um, hence the name. We're trying to get them shut down because they have been a bad neighbor for decades and they can't seem to get their act together. So, you know, those are really powerful personal stories of your experience, Joe, from what has been happening in your community because of Norlake. Can you talk about from the community perspective? Can you share with us some of the health, the safety, the property rights, the environmental implications of Norlake's operations? Yeah, sure. I can. And I know once uh, I know many stories, but. One day in the uh, during the winter, um, I was outside and I was just going to my car and it was a a day it had snowed a couple of days before. So you know that you know when I was a kid, I, again not knowing that this black snow is from Norlay, I was like, oh great, it's a fresh snow, so I can play in it for the first couple of days because after that it just gets dirty to play in. Um, so when I was, I was looking at this kid playing, this little girl actually playing at the playground and she was playing in the snow, but it was a few days later. So that's, that meant the snow was actually dirty and she was actually getting the particulate matter on her hand from that snow and you could see it. Um, it was quite grotesque and, and quite startling, you know, startling. <laughs> to see that and uh we told her you know not to play in that because it's dirty snow so thankfully she stopped but you know these are things that kids don't know about you know they're innocent i remember when i was a child we would play in the creek that runs from norlight to look for frogs and and turtles and such and we would see the impacts of norlight again not knowing in the creek with their beings that the water was just extremely discolored in some places and had oil in it and had these weird sacks and bags in, in the water itself. So it was just very strange and we never knew what it was. Um, but now I can almost certainly tell you it was from Norlight because this creek li literally runs from the facility. Um, so there's a lot of impacts just to the children I think are often overlooked in these types of issues. And um, when we were advocating to shut this place down and we were going door to door, we would speak with local residents at Saratoga sites. And one of these one of these children, I knocked on the door, they answered it and they almost screamed because they thought we were folks from Norlight. Because before that, a couple of weeks ago, before we went out, Norlight was knocking on doors trying to promote being a good neighbor and et cetera, et cetera. So they were afraid that, that we were Norlight. They were afraid to answer the door because they know that the problems that they were having, they, were get, they would get uh, chronic nosebleeds, never had it before they moved in. And now they have had it. Chronic nosebleeds, asthma, different things that no, we haven't ourselves proven that from Norlight, but you can on, only just wonder. You know, these children that have never had these issues before, they move in here and now they suffer these different ailments. Um, so it, it's truly sad, but it's also uplifting to see the community get together at times against this facility and seeing, you know, the voters of New York State passing a Green Amendment that... Uh, we so much love. So, you know, I could go on and on about the different impacts to the community and such, but I really think the stories of the children are, are the most important because not often is that looked at. Thank you for sharing that, Joe. So Todd, from a legal perspective, this case started as an enforcement action of the state against Norlight, but then lights out Norlight and the community with your representation got involved in the case. Can you tell us a little bit about that involvement, the decision and why you made the decision to intervene in the case? Sure. Yeah. So um, 
you know, the state as the, the environmental agency for the state is the Department of Environmental Conservation, and they had been somewhat active, uh, pretty active in enforcing violations by Norlite over the past couple decades. There were over a dozen, I believe, notices of violation. There have been multiple administrative orders, which is not not going to court, but having the agency give an order to Norlite to, to clean up their act or to comply with the dust containment or some other aspect of a violation. Then the, the stat was uh, proving to be largely ineffective because every time there was a new administrative order, there was another violation shortly thereafter. And so DEC took the rather unusual step of actually suing Norlite in court. So that was the original case. So su DEC sued Norlite for multiple violations of their permits. The reason we got involved is Lights Out Norlite reached out to my clinic um, and needed representation. We provide pro bono representation for, for community groups and environmental groups. And we wanted to get involved because there had been a long history of DEC trying to enforce and then Norlite subsequently violating that, those orders and those enforcements. And so we thought the community should have a voice in that litigation and have a say in how it was resolved. The last thing anybody wanted to see was a, you know, a minor fine or penalty. And then business goes on as usual as it has been, as Joe has described, that hasn't been good enough, right? Up until now. And so we, we sued um, both against Norlite and torts, um, you know, nuisance kind of claims and against the state under the green amendment. And uh, the reason we brought the green amendment claim is the state, year after year was trying to enforce existing laws and regulations and that was proving to not be sufficient to result in clean air and clean water and a healthful environment and the green amendment gave us that argument right whatever you're doing is still unconstitutional because you are violating this fundamental right to a clean environment and unless you do more and we advocated for shutting down no light um it's not going to be enough to just simply keep enforcing the same laws and regulations over and over again. So that's kind of the origin of the suit. That's why we intervened. The court granted us that motion. Um, so we are now parties to the lawsuit. So you spoke a little bit, um, Todd, about the importance and the values of having a New York Green Amendment. Um, so I want to start with Joe, but you might want to then add a little bit more. And I'm I'm really wondering, Joe, how has having this newly recently passed New York Green Amendment, right? This this constitutional right of all New Yorkers to clean water and air and a healthful environment. How has having that new constitutional right empowered your community in taking action to address what's happening at Norlight and really protecting yourselves, your community and your environment? Yeah, no, I think the Green Amendment is critical because I think if this issue would have happened five years ago, even, I don't think we would be in, in the same spot we're in today with all the success we've seen um, from the state and and through the courts as well. Um, and just to know, I believe the Green Amendment was one of the only ballot measures that passed that year on the election. So it, it very much a New Yorkers care about a clean future for future generations and for themselves. So I would just say, you know, it's given us the tools and and the language and the fight to really go against these facilities because it's time to right the wrongs of the past. They've been violating and violating and violating for years without any kind of repercussions. Now it's time to get your act together. We're in 2024. We don't want another Norlight and the next, you know, 30, 24. So we really want to have clean air, clean water, and a clean environment for our future generations, because that's what we're fighting for. I don't want another Joe Ritchie at Saratoga sites or in Cohoes even, or in the capital region to deal with any of these problems that can be solved now, because just it, will, it just puts more people at harm. And that's what we're trying to stop is those becoming harm due to these types of issues, either through, you know, PCBs in our water to silica dust in our air. We have to stop it so our future generations can be safe and that we can finally right the wrongs of the past. 
Yeah, I think that Joe covered it really well. I think I would only add just from the legal perspective, is it it's a direct tool as a protection for the citizens as it relates to the government action, or in this case, you know, limited government government action or government inaction. Um, and so what what it gives you is is a clear right to protect your environment that doesn't really exist in a comparable way under New York existing statutory law or regulatory law. And in fact, despite New York being a relatively green state, a relatively environmentally conscious state, there's no citizen suits, for example, to enforce New York's environmental statutes. The Green Amendment gives you that protection that you might not otherwise have if you are simply trying to enforce existing statutes and regulations. And as I mentioned before, you know, the existing statutes and regulations have proven somewhat ineffective here. And so the Green Amendment gives you that extra layer of protection that, you know, if everything else isn't good enough, you have this fundamental right. And that's enforceable. Can you share a little bit about how the state has responded to your intervention in this legal action and your New York Green Amendment arguments? One, how have they responded? And two, you know, what are your thoughts about that response? So they have been resistant. Um, I think up until now, it's been now two years, a little over two years since the Green Amendment was passed. I think DEC in particular views it more as a threat than as a tool. They feel like they must defend themselves against Green Amendment claims. And in fairness to DEC, they are brought, they are the defendant in, in these actions, right? Um, and so they they opposed our intervention. We won that. Then they moved to dismiss our claims of, under the Green Amendment, arguing that it doesn't give us the right to compel them to enforce against Norlight, and the court denied that motion. It doesn't mean we ultimately will prevail, but the court held that we at least can make that argument, can make that claim. Uh, so up until now, they've been resistant. Um, my thoughts on that is I, I, you know, I used to work at the attorney general's office, so I can see how they might want to avoid or fight against being sued or, or brought, having claims brought against them. But at the same time, I wish they would take on a little bit more of a proactive use of the amendment. This would be a case, a very good case where DEC itself could be arguing, even if this, they are technically compliant with this reg or that reg what they are doing is not sufficient to avoid these constitutional violations. So require more. And in fact, in DEC's own complaint, they looked to California regulations because uh, New York's, I, I'm assuming because they felt New York's were not specific enough or protective enough. And so in that situation where your existing laws and regulations aren't protective enough, it seems that they could adopt the Green Amendment as a tool and not see it merely as a threat. But uh, maybe we'll get there. Joe, how was it from your, you know, your community perspective to have the state be pushing back on your claims that you have this constitutional entitlement that 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 they are not properly respecting and protecting? Yeah, I mean, I think Todd is right. They're trying to pr protect against liability, especially in the Norlight uh, example, because all throughout this whole entire time at least I think for as long as I've been alive, and that's over 24 years now, um, they've had an on-site monitor at the facility at Norlight. So they've had people day by day saying, yes, that's okay to do. Yes, that's okay to do. Yes, you can incinerate 2 million pounds of PFAS illegally. Um, <laughs> so they've pretty much given Norlight the okay to pollute these past couple decades. And you know, and I can't speak for other cases, but specifically Norlight, they want to protect themselves. And I can see that. But at the same time, they could also say, you know what, you're right, you know, mm -hmm. let's right the wrongs of the past, like I've said, and let's work for the future. Because the people of New York, not, not our elected or local officials, but the people of New York voted on and passed this regulation. So whether we like it or not, we have to comply, we have to get our act together. So one final question, can you just share with us what are your ultimate goals from this really important and empowering legal work and your ongoing advocacy? 
Sure, Joey, do you want to start or should I? Uh, sure. take that? Yeah, I can start. Yeah, I mean, as the name, as the name implies, Lights Out Norlight, we want to shut down this facility. Um, I think we are closer than we ever have been before to shutting this facility down. We had a rally about mm, a year, a year and a half ago. And there were folks from a previous organization that came to us that was trying to shut down Norlight in the early 2000s. And I think these people are now like 80 years old now. And they say to you, they say to you, you know, you guys give us real hope to sh that we can actually see this facility shut down. And I'm fighting for those people and the people that I know in my community who we've lost, who wanted to see this facility shut down for decades. They lived in Saratoga sites almost their entire life and they can't see this come to fruition. So I'm fighting for them. You know, I'm making sure that there isn't another Joe Ritchie fighting this fight in another 20 years. We want this done now. Yeah. So this really needs to be completed. And I think we're, we're closer than ever. So I'm really excited to uh, be working with Todd and to be making sure that this green amendment has some, has some legal stick to it. And I think that covers it. Great. I, I think that if I want to boil it down to what, I think the lawsuit can and should accomplish is it to compel the state to listen to its citizens and to listen to the people affected and not view it, not, you know, the state agency doesn't view itself as the end all be all and arbiter of what is okay and what is not. You have to also give some voice to the public and some, some say to the people who are directly affected by the pollution um, and take, take that into account when making your decisions and deciding how you're going to enforce the laws. And so I think that is kind of the, the heart of the claims in this case is to make sure the citizens aren't just an afterthought in how DEC and Norlight negotiate some kind of settlement. I just, I want to thank you, Joe. I want to thank you, Todd. I want to thank Lights Out Norlight. I want to thank the Pace Environmental Litigation Clinic for being such amazing champions for the New York Green Amendment and going out there being at the forefront of the movement to set strong precedent and ensure that the New York Green Amendment is really going to make a powerful difference for the healthy lives and environments here in the state of New York. Thank you so, so much for being such champions for the Green Amendment, for the earth and for your communities. Thanks so much for having us. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.